Hi, everybody. This lecture is going to cover the HTTP protocol. That's the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. This is the way that web browsers and web servers talk to each other. The web browser will make an HTTP request to the server. The server, which is sitting and listening for that request, will reply in kind. And that's the underlying foundation of how all browsers and all web servers talk to each other. So this is pretty important stuff. This is, uh, you know, it's a little technical, but understanding it really helps to understand what your web server is doing, regardless of what type of web server you have, whether it's Windows, Linux, an appliance, it doesn't matter. Whether your client is a browser, you know, IE, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, or some utility that's that's running in the background or maybe that's part of an app that's actually doing web requests in the background doesn't matter this is the way that all of those things talk together to actually share information back and forth so we're going into a little bit of a deep dive on this one it's a little technical this might be a little bit of a longer lecture than some of the ones i have planned but it's going to set up the the groundwork the foundation for everything else we need to cover in this class and really getting in and understanding how servers work so Let's jump into it, shall we? As I mentioned before, HTTP is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. The HTTP standard specifies communications between clients and servers. The HTTP server cannot normally be a client and a client cannot be a server. Uh, they serve distinct specific roles. The client makes a request and the server sends back a response. Now, you can have some variations on this. Applications on a server can be a client um, because they can go and make requests as part of fulfilling the original request. Proxies arguably serve both roles because a client will talk to the proxy, the proxy will talk to the server, the server talks back to the proxy, the proxy back to the client. We're going to get into that a little bit later in this class, but basically just keep in mind that the client does one task, the server does the other, and they really don't tra trade places in any way. Now, the idea behind HTTP goes all the way back in some ways to the 1930s with a system created by, or at least envisioned by Vannevar Bush that was based on microfilm to store all kinds of information and then be able to retrieve and manage that information. Uh, 1960s came along and people had some cool ideas of things to do with computers and one of those was the Xanadu project. And that was a way of linking content together, but, and then there would never like be copies of that content. Everything would be an original. And part of that was also supposed to be a way around copyright, because even though copyright wasn't the complete mess that it is today, um, it was a mess back then. And there were limitations and, and the whole idea of being able to share information by linking pieces of that information together and then clicking on those links. That idea really came all the way back in the 1960s. In the 1980s, Tim Berners-Lee and his team were working on a slightly different project and are the ones that are credited with inventing HTTP, HTML, and that first web server and text-based web browser that went together. And Berners-Lee is still very active in the web community today, um, starting with his World Wide Web project back in 1989. Project Xanadu also still exists, and it claims to be superior to the web and accuses Berners-Lee of stealing his their idea, but they're not really in production. I think they did finally come out with a 1.0 version a few years back, but no one uses it. Whereas today, the World Wide Web is the standard way that most people access information from the internet. Now, HTTP protocol has a variety of different versions. Uh, 0 0.9 was first documented in 1991. It really was the document that explained how they were using it at the time. It certainly wasn't complete by any means. In 1996, HTTP 1.0, 1 which is still available and still works uh, in simple servers, and most servers and clients can fall back to it. That's when a first standard really came around, although the uh, document the RFC, the request for comments. Um, RFCs are request for comments documents. They are out on the internet. You can read a whole bunch of them. There are thousands of them that explain how the internet works. So by developers, for developers, 
And, and as I've noted here in RFC 1945, which was in 1996, it explicitly says right in the document, this is not a standard. And they had concerns about scalability and performance, and they talked about that when they wrote that document. And so this isn't really quite ready to be a spec yet, but this is what the protocol is. You know, a few years later, 1999, and they finally ironed out some of those bugs. And so HTTP 1.1 came around. It's the current standards documented in RFC 2616 and specified that this is an Internet Standards Track Protocol. Um, you can read about these uh, at w3.org, which is a good place to read about all of the standards on the Internet. Uh, it's a good website to know of. Not exactly light reading. It's really heavy and boring and technical that you wouldn't, most people wouldn't just go there and read information, but it is it is pretty much the authoritative source for information about HTTP, about HTML, about CSS, and a lot of other things that are used on the web. Uh, it is the World Wide Web Consortium uh, is what the W3Org website is all about. So you're looking at this information and you say, hmm, we haven't really changed HTTP since 1999. And that's mostly true, uh, but not completely true. There's a new protocol, HTTP2, which was originally going to be the 2.0, HTTP 2.0. But it changed things enough that it's really treated as a separate protocol. And we're not really going to dive into it in this class. Um, a few years back, Google was working on the problem of trying to make things faster. And so they came up with a protocol called SPDY or Speedy. And the whole idea behind the Speedy protocol was that it would work faster. It would use information a little bit more persistently and efficiently than the older standards. Um, and Speedy was first introduced in Google Chrome and mostly only worked with Google's websites. Um, so there would be some SPDY connections that would pop up if you were using Chrome and working with like Gmail or any of the things, any parts of Google Drive. Um, and by 2015, you know, most major browsers do support HTTP2. Adoption steadily increasing. I, I looked at some things as I was putting this together and was actually kind of surprised by how many websites out there actually do support this standard. But again, it's beyond the scope of this class. We're going to stick with the simple fundamentals, and um, and that's going to be covering HTTP 1.0 and 1.1 and how that all works. So clients can be, as I've kind of already alluded to, anything. They could be graphical web browsers that you're used to using. Um, there are some text-based web browsers out there, like Lynx, which is spelled a couple of different ways, depending on which Lynx browser you're using. Um, and I have used, especially the first one, LYNX, that Lynx browser. Um, it's still a handy way to check websites. I mean, it's, it's actually a good way to do a quick accessibility check because it gives you just the HTML. It doesn't give you any of the visual markup of a site. Um, and there are command line tools. And the two that I use a lot, again, are curl and wget. Uh, both of those are command line tools that you can specify the URL on the command line, get an answer back. You're going to see some screenshots of curl here in a couple minutes because I use it to demonstrate uh, some of the other things that we're going to cover in this lecture. And then finally, applications programs, uh, desktop applications, mobile or server-based programs can use HTTP to get information from a server rather than going by you know, perhaps more traditional means. Um, RESTful applications are pretty much the subset of the most common way that that gets done these days. RESTful applications work out really, really well because, you know, as internet security became a bigger problem and we started locking things down in firewalls, especially corporate firewalls, enterprise firewalls, HTTP web traffic is, or at least HTTPS web traffic, is something that we pretty much let through every firewall. So applications that use their own proprietary format started to be a real pain. You would have to go to the firewall administrator and say, I need this port opened to this IP address so that my application will work. And people got smart and realized that the better way to do this was to let those applications talk across HTTP traffic, which, again, is already let through the firewall. One of the earlier methods for this is XML RPC. Uh, XML RPC used XML formatted requests and response to tell the server, execute a remote procedural call. They basically tell it, 
I want you to execute this specific method that you have in your system and return back a result. And so it was very limited and you had to, you know, write the methods and write everything according to that XML RPC spec in order for it to communicate at all. The next protocol that came along that made this a little better was SOAP. And SOAP stands for Simple Object Access Protocol. You would simply ask for an object and it would simply return the object as requested. But that's about the only thing that was simple about SOAP. SOAP is a very strict messaging protocol. It has very precise data dictionaries. And if your request isn't formatted perfectly to match that dictionary of what it's expecting, it'll throw back errors or it'll just fail silently. It won't really work at all. A newer way of doing things called REST or representational state transfer uh, came up and replaced SOAP. So REST is great because it's stateless. Every request contains all the information required. It doesn't build on earlier requests. You can access resources, which are all defined by the URLs. So whatever type of resource you need to require, it's going to have a URL on the server, just like a web page. But instead of a web page, your response could be HTML or it could be XML. It could be JSON or it could be another format. So here is a very, very messy screenshot uh, example of a REST API call and response. Now the client I used for this is curl. And if you look up here at the top, you'll see that the URL I hit is cis294.hfcc.edu slash api.php. And then built into my request here, the D is the data that I sent, I've got a username, a password, request of git product, and a description equals printer. And what this did is it sent me back all of the products in that site um, that were printers. And it sends it back in JSON format. I go to the API. And from the API, I asked, I say, get product, give me printers. It gave me back all those printers in JSON format. And that's the basic foundation of uh, REST API and how it works. Rather than coming back in HTML that's ready to view, now my client can grab all this information from this uh from this output and use it. And that's how REST applications or RESTful applications work. So an HTTP session, you know, a conversation between a client and a server is called a session. And an HTTP session is just a sequence of request and response transactions. The client sends a request to the server. The server replies with a response. Um, HTTP 0.9 and, and 1.0 one request per connection and then the actual TCP connection is stopped. And so each time you request another piece of information from that server, you have to establish a connection first and in each time. Uh, 1.1, one of the advantages is that it allows persistent connections to, re you know, so you can reuse that connection. So you'll, your client will connect to the web server and then it'll request something and get the response back. And then instead of dropping that connection right away, It'll keep it and it'll be ready for the next request to go again. It just makes things a little bit faster because every time you connect to a server, there's a little bit of latency divine. Uh, there's a little bit of latency that is uh, introduced by the network itself and by just the way that network devices talk to each other. Both HTTP requests and responses contain headers. They start with headers, which are one or more lines of text. And those lines of text specify details about, you know, what other actions can be taken by the server or the client. Like what kind of request am I making? What kind of response am I returning? All of that stuff is included in those, in those header lines. Um, like I said, they're plain text. They're at the top of the request or the top of the response. And they let servers and clients share information back and forth. Rather than trying to describe them here, we'll see what these headers look like. Um, in context, but I just wanted to point out now that they exist. HTTP requests are one or more lines of text sent by the client. The first line of the request header contains the method to use and the URI of the content being requested. What type of request am I making and where is it located on the server? The, the request can have additional lines and those provide information about the client that the server can either use or ignore when it's generating the response, depending on what that information is and whether or not it's relevant to this specific response. The most common types of requests are get, head, and post. Uh, get requests does what it sounds like. It gets information from the server. 
the head request is very is identical to the get request except that it only returns the header information and doesn't actually return the data there are times when we want to look at that header maybe to compare it to a previous get request and if it hasn't changed then we know what we need to know and we don't really need the full request and all of the data that follows after it that's handy when that request would be for a large file we just want to check and see if it matches the one we got before and we can often get that information just by doing a head request. Post request is a way to send data to the server. We actually send a data object as part of the request. And we're going to look at that a little bit more specifically later. Then there are other requests, put, delete, trace. There are a handful of requests that don't get used as often. Now, those first three common requests were the only requests that were supported in HTTP 1.0. All of the other request types were added in when the 1.1 specification. Responses are also come back there. They contain a header, which is also lines of text. Starts off with that. The very first line of the header contains a three digit status code that indicates whether that request was a success or a failure. Again, other lines in the header can contain information about the response, including the type of content that's coming back, the, um, the time, how long before that piece of content expires, uh, you can consider it to be good up to a certain point of time, everything else like that. The header must be followed by a blank, blank line, and then the rest of the response contains all of the data that's being returned. So let's look at a simple GET request. We're going to go back to our screenshots of curl, and this time I'm just going to go get the main front web page, which is kind of boring if you've ever looked at it, from the CIS Linux server. So I'm using curl and I use the minus V to give me some verbose information about what's going on. So we see the communication here start getting connected. We see the SSL connection come back and verifying the certificate. And then here's our get request. For our get request from curl, we sent four lines of the request. Get the root page. We didn't specify a server name, so it's just the root of the server that we connected to. And we're telling it that the protocol is HTTP 1.1. We always want to specify our protocol as we go. We're also sending it, sending it the user agent. So if the server cares what type of user agent we're using, then it'll know. And it could sometimes respond in kind. Sometimes we'll just log that information and otherwise ignore it. We tell it, here's where we can tell it that we wanted that root, um, we wanted that root URI stem from cislinux.hfcc.edu and we're telling it that we will res we will accept responses back in any format in any content type so send me back whatever you want you can set a specific accept header if you want uh, in a restful case you would say accept maybe uh, j text json it says i just want json data back and that's please send me that instead of html the response header right here, HTTP 1.1, and we're responding in 1.1. We requested in 1.1, we're responding in 1.1. 200 is the code for OK. We're going to delve into these more in a, in a different lecture. It's giving us the current server date, uh, the server itself, what it's powered by. Some This is a caching piece of information. It tells us the length of the content. Uh, then we're going to close the connection and the content type is text HTML and it's also telling us the character set. And then there's a blank line right here. There's a blank line in the response. And then here's the page that comes back. And then after that page came back, it closed connection. So that's the very fundamental piece of a get request. It has the, it has the request, the response header, a blank line, and then the actual content, which is a web page in HTML. Post requests, we looked at that before in our API, um, and we and we that time we looked at the response. We're going to shorten up our query a little bit. We're going to get products of type keyboard this time from our from our API. So you can see how that works now. It's a post. Here's the URL: api.php, HTTP 1.1. Again, our user agent. Our host will accept anything. The size of our request is 77 characters. And we're in the content type of our request is basically a form. We basically used curl to pretend that we submitted a form. 
a response coming back, HTTP 1.1, 200 is again the code for OK. It's the date, server, powered by, we set a session cookie here. The server decided the that we should set a, we should set a cookie for this. Um, expires header. Basically, if you notice, this expires header is November 19th, 1981, which means it's already expired. And then even more so, it's also telling us uh, specifically about caching. Do not store, do not cache, revalidate, and recheck every time. And then another way, it's telling us basically three ways. Don't cache this response. As we learn as we dive a little deeper into post requests later, post requests cannot be cached. Our content length is 242 bytes. And it's going to send back application JSON. I think I said text JSON a few minutes ago. That would have been incorrect. Again, we got our blank line. And then we're actually getting some debug info here. So that's not in sequence. This is just the verbose thing from curl. And then here's our response. And this time our response data is in JSON, which matches up with the content type that we were told here. And so this is a post request that simulates a form where these pieces of information were submitted in the form. And then this is what came back with a header in JSON and then our JSON data. Now, the other type of request that you're gonna see a lot, um, this is a simple get request, but we're gonna show a different code and everybody knows good old 404 not found. So we're gonna request a page that straight up does not exist. Here's our request, the URL and our HTTP version user agent, host, accept headers again. And here's our response coming back. HTTP 1.1, 404 not found. That's the code here. That's what the client needs to see is this 404 message here. All the other headers are what you've probably come to expect by now, our blank space. And then this document comes back, which is the 404 message that the user sees in a browser the the web browser got the information it needed here it uses this information to convey that same message to the end user but this is the data for that response and that's it that is our overview to http we're going to come back in a couple of shorter videos now and look at some of the specific parts of this but that's the overview